Han skal der træde, han skal der lave af. Det går helt ærmest til skærm. Det er Well, it's just about nine o'clock, so we'd like to give you all a very warm welcome to our midweek meeting as once again we turn to the Word and as once again we seek to pray to the Lord our God to look down upon us, upon our people and upon our nation in mercy and in grace. So a warm word of welcome to all who are gathered here, a warm word of welcome to those who are joining with us online and we trust as always as we meet together in this fashion this evening, whether here or whether at home the Lord God will speak to us in no uncertain terms through his word. Let us then come to the Lord now in prayer. Let us all pray. Our gracious God and loving Heavenly Father, it hardly seems a, a week since last we met in this place. And yet we realize our God it is, because time as we know it is moving on, Time as we know it is marching on. For we are creatures of space and of time. We are here today. And in the greater scheme of things, we are gone tomorrow. But we bless you, our Father, that when we approach you, when we seek your face, when we come before your throne, when we humble ourselves before you. We humble ourselves before the one who is beyond space and beyond time. The one who is the king of the ages, the mighty God. The one who is from eternity to eternity. Beyond our understanding beyond our comprehension. We consider such truth our God, and we are dumbfounded. We hardly know what to say or what to think. For you are God who reigns and who rules through time and through eternity. So we bless you, our Father, for who you are. And the more we remember who you are, the greatness of your glory, the more we are amazed that you listen to children like us. The more we are amazed that not only do you look down upon us and see us, not only do you know us as we are, but despite that, you have compassion upon us. And every day that we live, we experience your compassion and we taste your pity. But supremely, we see your compassion and your pity, your mercy and your grace. As we look to your Son, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ who even as we meet in this small room this evening, is seated at your right hand and is making intercession for sinners like us. We do find this hard to understand. We do find this hard to grasp. But even as we struggle to understand it and to grasp it, we come at the same time to bless you for the truth of it, to thank you for the salvation that is ours in Christ Jesus, to thank you that when through grace and trusting in his finished work you adopt us into your family, we are able to approach you as children to a father. We are able to speak to you as children to a father. 
and we are able to depend upon you, the one who loves us and the one who gave his son to save us and the one who never grows weary or tired, the one who never sleeps. We come tonight, our God, to thank you for such truth to thank you for the salvation that is ours in Christ Jesus, that hope which is sure and which is certain. But so too we come to thank you for your word, how your word instructs us, how your word directs us, how it is a light to our feet and a lamp unto our path. And when we walk in the light of that word, We walk in a way that is pleasing and acceptable to you. So tonight we pray, as once again we would turn to the book of Job, that though these things are hard and difficult for us to understand and to grasp, you would speak to us through the scripture, that we might be better instructed in the things of God, that we might be challenged, that we might be encouraged, that even as a result of our meeting around this word tonight, we might be made that little bit more like that one who loved us and who gave himself for us. So meet with us now, we pray. Open our eyes by your Spirit as we turn to your word and forgive us for all of our sins. For it's in the Saviour's name we pray. Amen. We turn this evening once again to the book of Job and we turn to Job chapter 2, Job chapter 2 and verses 1 to 10 and the title of our our study this evening is Upping the Ante, Upping the Ante. Job chapter 2 and verses 1 to 10, let us hear the word of God. Again there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan also came among them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said to Satan, From where have you come? Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth, and from walking up and down on it. And the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil? He still holds fast to his integrity, although you incited me against him to destroy him without reason. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin, all that a man has he will give for his life. But stretch out your hand and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, he is in your hand. Only spare his life. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and struck Job with loathsome sores from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. And he took a piece of broken pottery with which to scrape himself while he sat in the ashes. Then his wife said to him, Do you still hold fast to your integrity? Curse God and die. But he said to her, You speak as one of the foolish women would speak. Shall we receive good from God? And shall we not receive evil? And in all this, Job did not sin with his lips. And we close there in verse 10. Trusting God will bless this reading from his word. You will remember from last week that God's servant Job has not just remained faithful through the darkness, through his trial, through his difficulty. He has not only remained faithful, but he has come out the other side of his trial undaunted. So much so that the living God is simply delighted with his servant. And he is not afraid to say so in this instance to Satan. What do we read there in verse 3? And the Lord said to Satan, 
Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil? He still holds fast to his integrity, although you incited me against him to destroy him without reason. God is basically saying to Satan, look, you know that all that my servant has gone through. You know all the difficulties, all the trials, all the trouble that has come upon him. And still, he remains true. And God is delighted. And just in passing, we noted this before, didn't we, in Job chapter 1, when God speaks of Job. But thinking about you and me, thinking about ourselves, as we think of ourselves from last week to this week, is God able to say that about you and that about me? In a similar scenario, would the living God look at us and say, look at my servant here. I am simply delighted in his faithfulness during, and as we discovered last week, not only during, but after his trial. Despite all that has happened to him, despite all that has happened to you, despite all that has happened to me, despite all that has happened to us on occasions, is the living God in heaven able to look down upon us And to say to our adversary, the devil, look at so-and-so, how faithful and true have they been, and how faithful and true are they. A little challenge. But then firstly, as we look to these verses this evening, we see that Satan remains convinced, despite all the evidence to the contrary, that he will be able to break Job. And he now suggests to the living God, if he is able to take Job's life, or at least threaten to take the life of Job, Job will break. What does Satan say there in verse 4 to the living God? He says this, Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin, all that a man has, he will give for his life. Satan, you see, is no fool. And I'm sure if you have lived at all, you have seen it with someone who has been ill and perhaps gravely ill. Sometimes they are given no time at all to live and to survive, but they fight and they fight and they fight against all the odds. They hang on to life for as long as they can. And Satan knows that. And he says, skin for skin, all that a man has, he will give for his life. Some years ago, I was reading one of the papers about an incident that occurred out in Mexico. Five fishermen left a port on the Pacific side of Mexico to head out into the sea to catch sharks. Not for fun, but for meat. And they went out, as always they did, with the gear they usually used for the shark fishing. They headed out into the ocean. They began to fish for the sharks, but they lost their gear. And anyone who knows anything about fishing, even in our land, will know that gear is expensive very expensive. And so it is said that these five fishermen began to search for their gear to see if they could hook it and pull it back on board. But they failed. But in their failure, they forgot to check if they had enough fuel to keep searching. And they ran out of fuel. There was an offshore wind that blew their boat further out into the Pacific Ocean And as if that wasn't bad enough, the boat was then caught in one of the currents in that great ocean. And they were found 
5,000 miles away in the Marshall Islands by a Taiwanese trawler. Nine months and nine days later. In the course of being lost at sea, two of the crew men died. But three survived. And one of the three was a Christian who had his Bible with him. But not only did he have his Bible with him, but strange as it might seem, not long before they set sail, he had set, he had sat a course on how to survive at sea. And for nine months and nine days, they drifted. And those other two members of the crew, they nicknamed the Christian on the boat Cap. Because he was so adept at catching the gulls and the other birds that would land on the craft. But can you imagine the determination that it took to bury two of your seafaring friends?